Hello, this is the review lecture on the first module quiz of the strategic management course. This is the summary of the results on the quiz on the course introduction and strategic thinking module, um, as well as a discussion of the questions on that quiz that seem to cause the most difficulty or, or presented a challenge to the most students. So, Again, I've already sort of presented these results in class, but the distribution statistics overall, the grades range from a, a low of 51 to a max of 100. Um, as I mentioned, I think it was on the order of 15%. A fair number of students did get 100 on the quiz, so that shows that that's good, very encouraging. Um, <clears throat> the mean score is an 88.1. And the distribution statistics, um, again, I break it down this way because, um, of course, I don't assign an individual letter grade to each quiz, but to give you an idea of where you fall, because I do, you know, give uh, A's to the top 40% at least of the class, then A minuses to the next 40%, um, and then B pluses to the bottom 20% or less. I usually give fewer than that, but it gives you an idea of where your grade might fall in the scoring range if, you know, this were, for example, to be your only grade component in the course. Um, the quiz consisted of 22 questions, and 18 out of those 22 questions, the average score was at least 80% or above. So that means that on questions that were sort of either yes or no, or right or wrong, with one right answer, um, that means that at least 80% of the class answered it correctly. On the questions that were partial credit, which are a few of them were partial credit, that means that the average score on the, on the question was at, at least 80% of the maximum possible or score. And so what that means is that for 18 of the 22 questions were not terribly challenging in the sense that students did quite well on those. It's not worth our time to go over those questions uh, individually. Um, and uh, certainly if you have concerns about any of those 18 questions that most people answered correctly, then uh, your first recourse, certainly I would encourage you to ask your colleagues. But then, of course, I am available to communicate or discuss those questions as well as if, if, if sort of the answers are not satisfactory or you're confused or, or there's an issue or a concern beyond that. Um, but I will go over the four questions that seem to be problematic for a fair number of you. Um, remember the quiz was broken into four sections. Uh, there were, there were uh, about equal number, five or six questions each of these sections on the introduction to strategy, basically the concept material from the first lecture. Um, a section on strategic thinking in general, what is it, what is it all about? a section on game theory, um, the principles of game theory, and finally, a section of the quiz on strategic biases. Um, as you can see, the f there were no questions particularly problematic or, or challenging for the majority of the class in strategic thinking or strategic biases, but there was one in the intro to strategy and three in the game theory section. So I'm going to go over those four challenging questions. So first, the question four, the fourth question in the intro to strategy section. So this is what, it was a true or false question, it said the following, true or false, strategy, quote unquote, is about choosing a unique and valuable position within the external environment and is not concerned with internal activities which are strictly the domain of other areas of management such as operations. Now I've the, added some emphasis, although I believe that the words external and internal were, were all caps in the original question to emphasize those, but I've highlighted uh, some elements of particular significance in this true or false statement. But the first thing we can do is, is realize that it's really, there's two parts to this statement. It's saying true or false. One, strategy is about choosing a unique and valuable position within the external environment. Two, and is not concerned with internal activities which are strictly the domain of other areas of management such as operations. Right? So in order for the statement to be true, both of these poor parts of the statement have to be true. Right? If one of them is false, then, then the statement as a whole is false. Um, and uh, if both of them are false, of course, the statement is always false. But it's got to be that both elements are, in fact, true. Now, let's take the first element. Strategy is about choosing a unique and valuable position within the external environment. Um, without much controversy, I think I can just simply say that is, in fact, very much true. Um, that part, remember, one of the distinguishing characteristics of strategy is about its focus on the external environment. And certainly, strategy is very much about choosing a unique and valuable position within the external environment. And so then the question becomes, what about the second part? 
you know, is it true that strategy is not concerned with internal activities because those are strictly the domain of other areas of management system operations? Right? Certainly, those are the domain of other areas of management system operations, but are they strictly? In other words, is it not part of strategy? Right? Is our internal activities not something we concern ourselves with in the field of strategy? Well, let's go back to simply the slides and materials that have been presented or presented on that first day when we talked about the introduction strategy. Here is a one of the slides that we presented, which is when we ultimately sort of came down to the positioning school of strategy and we focused on um, the definition of strategy according to the positioning school, according to Michael Porter in particular. And, he, and I showed you the following, following slide with the following explanation of strategy. Quote, strategy is the creation of a unique and valuable position involving a different set of activities, unquote. And then I highlighted certain words of particular significance. Um, position, which emphasized the external perspective, uh, activities, emphasizing the internal perspective, valuable, the idea of comparative advantage, um, and unique and different, you know, emphasizing the importance of doing something that is distinct. Well, each of those are important, but here for our purposes, right, remember our true or false statement is about how much strategy is concerned, or, or is strategy concerned with external, internal, or both? Well, here we see, of course, and I highlighted this, that the fact that we talk about activities, we are concerned, strategy is indeed focused on the internal perspective. Yes, we care about the position, but the idea is how do you create that position, right? And the answer is, of course, with, through activities, what you do internally. So strategy is concerned with the external and the internal. Um, in fact, here's another slide from that first day lecture. Remember, I talked about that when we evaluate strategy, we look at t you know, the, the three most significant tests of strategy are with respect to external, internal, and dynamic alignment. Well, of course, external alignment is about the external environment and positioning in the external environment. But internal alignment is very much about inter the, you know, the in internal operations, activities inside the organization. Right? Is, is, are the activities aligned with the strategy? Are the activities aligned with each other? Right? So again, another slide for the first day emphasizing the importance of uh, in the internal environment or internal operations for the field of strategy. And of course, if you look at, we talked about this idea of the unified universal strategic analysis um, that we talked about how ultimately we do both external, internal, and dynamic analysis. We, those are the three primary types of analysis. And, and here we have the map of our four modules of the course. The first module being strategic thinking, the second being external analysis, the third internal analysis, and finally the fourth being dynamic analysis. So again, what you see is that Internal analysis is, in, is an entire module of the course. In fact, that's the biggest module of the course. It is, it is, you know, we have three classes on internal analysis and only two on external dynamic analysis and only two on strategic thinking. So clearly strategy is very much concerned with internal aspects of the organization or firm. So if we go back to this question, true or false, we said the first part of the statement is true. What about the second one? That strategy is not concerned with internal activities, which are strictly the domain of other areas of management system operations. Well, that is clearly false. In fact, the definition of strategy talks about activities. And the word right here, activities, you know, internal activities, that is, you know, in, in, even in our brief 10 some odd word definition of strategy, activities uh, are emphasized centrally. So this statement, question four on the quiz, was a false statement. Right? Um, because it had two parts, one of which was true and one of which was false. All right, well, what about, as I said, there, there were no problematic questions in the studio thinking qu portion of the quiz, but in game theory, there were three. Uh, questions two, four, and five. Now, the numbering here is off. This is when I look at the results on Sakai. It gives it to me this way. So this is the second, fourth, and fifth question in the game theory section. Um, this may be questions, if I'm trying to remember how many were, this may be questions 12, 14, and 15, you know, when you looked at the quiz, I'm not sure how, when you see your results, how it looks, but it's the second, fourth, and fifth question, right? The fourth and fifth of the last two. So you certainly should recognize them as I, as I, as I present them. But So question two was the following. It was also a true or false statement. True or false, a best response is an action or choice which is optimal no matter what actions other players choose, okay? Again, true or false, a best response. So we're going to be looking back at the definition of the word best response, or the phrase best response, is an action or choice which is optimal no matter what actions other players choose. So it is the best choice independent of what others do. No matter what other people do, it is your best choice. Well, let's look at the definition of best response. So this is a slide on game theory vocabulary. Remember, I had several of these I presented. 
I gave you a definition of a term and then the implications. Well, let's focus just on the top here, the definition of the term best response. What is the best response? The best response is an action or choice which is optimal. In other words, something that maximizes the player's path given the choices of their players. Right? So in light of, you know, considering, uh, holding constant the choices of the other players, right? So given what the other players are doing, a best response is a optimal choice. Right? But the first qualifying part is that given the choice of other players, right? So conditional on the other player's choices, a best response and action choice, which is optimal. So, for example, we illustrated best response, remember in the case study with Cronus lines versus the lesser intelligence lines, and this slide uh, was actually not just about the case study, this is actually uh, in the concept slides and in the concept slides that were separately posted and consolidated and put on Sakai. We highlighted, for example, here was the best response function of lesser intelligence line. We sort of said, Remember that this highlighted, you know, for any given action by Kronos lines, right? So we could choose a given price for Kronos lines. Here, starting the bottom, this is not the full matrix, but the bottom here, price of a thousand. The idea is, what is the best response for lesser intelligence, lesser intelligence lines? Well, lesser intelligence lines paths were in the upper right in blue, and so the best, if Kronos lines is going to choose a price of a thousand, we could find the best response for lesser intelligence lines by finding the biggest blue number in that row, which is 303 in this case, which means the best response for lesser intelligence line to a price of a thousand is 1100. And we can do that all the way up to here if, if Kronos lines charges a price of 1800, we look for the biggest blue number in that row, it's 1799. So this means that the best response for lesser intelligence lines to a price of 1800 by Kronos lines is a price of 1500. Right? And so what this does is it maps out the best response for LAL to any price by Kronos lines. So given a price choice by Kronos lines, what is lesser intelligence lines best response? The point is this is a not a, you know, when we sh shaded the cells yellow, it's not a perfectly vertical line. In other words, we're not shading only one price. The best choice for lesser intelligence lines depends on what Kronos lines does. Right? And we similarly, mapped out the best response function for Kronos lines. This is the best, this is the, we basically highlighted, remember, the biggest red number in each column, which was the best choice that Kronos line could make, you know, given any price choice by lesser intelligence lines. The point being that a best response is a function. It depends on what the other player does. Given the other player's choice, this is the best response. But it depends. It could, it will change, as we see here, depending upon what the other player chooses. So going back to our, again, our question here, the true or false statement, a best response is an action or choice which is optimal no matter what actions other players choose. Well, our definition of best response is similar, but not exactly that. Best response is an action or choice which is optimal given the choice of other players. In other words, a best response says that the best choice depends on what others do. Right? Whereas our true or false statement here at top says, is an action or choice which is optimal no matter what action other players choose. So it does not depend on what others do. Right? All right, well, you know, um, people probably were, I guess, fooled by this question or thrown off by this question because, you know, that does certainly sound familiar. What is that? Well, let's go to another slide that we had, our other game theory vocabulary. Here is the definition of a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is an action or choice which is optimal. In other words, produce the highest payoff no matter what actions other players choose. Ah, okay. So here, what we've just said, so a dominant strategy, unlike a best response, is an action or choice which is optimal no matter what other players choose. It doesn't conditional on or given what other players choose. Right? The best choice, in, in a situation when you have a dominant strategy, the best choice does not depend on what others do. It is independent of others' choices. It is always the same. So that is the distinction between a best response and a dominant strategy. Now, dominant strategy, a best response is a dominant strategy. I mean, I'm sorry, a dominant strategy is a best response, right? But a best response is not necessarily a dominant strategy, right? So the idea that you know, if you have a dominant strategy, your best response to the other player's actions is always the same. It's a best response, but it doesn't depend on what other players do, right? But a best response, by definition, is not an action or choice which is optimal no matter what other players, action other players choose. It is simply the choice that is optimal given what other players have, have chosen. Like in light of what they're choosing, yeah, you're to making the best choice. But it depends. If they made different choices, you would make different choices. Or you'd what would be optimal would be different. So 
Therefore, the statement is false. Right? It, it, that is the definition of a dominant strategy, not the definition of a best response. Right? So then, the next question, which is problematic, was this one. Right? Questions four and five were the actual games I asked you to solve. One being a Natrix game, or a normal form game, a strategic form game, depending on how you want to, what you want to call it, and the other being a game tree or an extensive form game. So let's look at question four. This is the, so this says, consider the matrix below, which describes the game to be played between Bob and Sue. Right? Now the question itself in the quiz had a lot more explanation and went into great detail to make sure there was no confusion about what was represented in the game. But I'm not going to have all the language here. But ultimately the punchline is this, what is or are the equilibrium outcome or outcomes of this game? Please check any and all correct answers. Right. Well, again, now, so what is this idea? What is equilibrium? Well, again, go back to our game theory vocabulary. Here's our definition of equilibrium. And we had a couple, you know, there was definitions, of course, in the in the reading. Um, there was also other slides that I presented that talked about it, but, but just it's all the same definition, obviously, right? Um, but the definition is an equilibrium is a set of actions such that no player wants to unilaterally change his action. Right? So a set of actions, one for each player, such that no player would want to unilaterally change his action. So if the others did not change, you wouldn't want to change. So at Nicolor Malcolm, each player chooses the best response to the other player's actions. Right? So again, understand some basic ideas here. Everybody is best responding to every other person, and nobody wants to unilaterally change their action. Now the important thing is unilaterally, because it is conceivable, and certainly the case, that if everybody could coordinate and change, they might want to. Right. But given the place of choices of other players, you don't want to change. Does not mean that you're making your best, you're getting the best possible outcome you could get, right? Because it just means you're getting the best you could get, you know, conditional on, given what the other player is doing, you're doing the best you can. But if other players' choices are, you know, you might want, you know, desire other players to change their choices, because that might do a better outcome for you. And they might desire the same thing as well, right? We saw that sort of in the pricing game and the prisoner's dilemma, which you've, uh, at least some of you have seen in, 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 your GE 3010 economics class, right? the idea that a Nash equilibrium, equilibrium outcome can sometimes be one that is suboptimal in the sense that um, collectively we would be better off at a different outcome if we could coordinate and get there. But it just means that given what you're doing, I'm best responding. Given what you're doing, you're best responding. Right? So we're each best responding to each other, and neither of us would want to change our choice, assuming the other player doesn't change theirs. So let's apply that concept then to our game here. And I think most students pretty quickly could figure out. I mean, you're, you naturally sort of, even without knowing game theory, you sort of naturally say, okay, well, you know, down left has to be an equilibrium, right? Four, four, those are the biggest numbers of the whole board. That's got to be, you know, and even not necessarily applying, you know, thinking too much about equilibrium, we, we certainly could be, um, see that as a likely certain equilibrium. Right? Um, how do we actually go about the analysis to, to confirm our uh, well, one way is is uh, there's you know we could certainly just go through the basic logic of equilibrium, or we could actually in the reading. So here's I've, I've actually quoted this is a roughly quotes directly from the reading that you had on game theory that was called the introduction to game theory and business strategy. So this is roughly an exact quote from that reading, although the reading talked about Boeing and Airbus, and so I have changed it to talk about row player and column player, so it's not specific to Boeing and Airbus, you know, where row player, of course, chooses um, a row, up or down, column player chooses a column, left to right. So here's what it says about the arrow technique. The arrow technique provides a simple way to identify a Nash equilibrium. Start by assuming that the row player will choose the top row, then draw an arrow pointing to the maximum payoff for the column player can achieve in this row. Right? Second, move to the bottom row and draw an arrow pointing to column player's highest payoff in this row. Right? So for the, for the idea is that column player can choose does not get to choose which row we play, but gets to choose which column. So the idea is draw an arrow to the best payoff for the column player in each row. Right? Third, assume column player will choose the left column and draw an arrow pointing to the row player's highest payoff in this column. So again, or in fourth, move to the right column and draw an arrow pointing to the row player's highest payoff in this column. The point being that the row player, of course, does not get to choose which column we're in, only which row. But if we're in the left column, what would row player, which row would uh, row player want to choose. If we're in the right column, which row would, would row player want to choose, which gives the highest payoff, right? And that ultimately, you draw the arrows that way, right? So then if an actual equilibrium exists, arrows will point to the payoffs for both players in that cell, right? The arrows will point towards the Nash equilibrium. Well, let's go, let's actually apply that, if you will, here, right? And we certainly can see, right, to confirm that down left is a Nash equilibrium, 
down for Bob, left for Sue. Well, that's first, for example, the idea is that, look, you know, the definition of natural equilibrium means that neither player would want to unilaterally deviate, right? Well, we can sort of, if we look at Bob's incentives, right, four is bigger than three, so we draw an arrow from three to four there. So Bob would certainly, if we're in the left column, Bob would certainly want to choose down. Right? Another way of putting this is, is can, given that if, if Sue chooses left, Bob wants to choose down. So therefore, that Bob would not, if we're in, in the down left outcome, in the red box here, certainly Bob would not want to unilaterally change his choice, right? Because he would just reduce his payoff from four to three. What about Sue? Well, we can draw the arrow for her associated paths, right? Four is bigger than three. So, so you know, if Bob chooses down, certainly Sue would want to choose left. Right? So this confirms, because the arrows no notice are both pointing towards you know, this path, that this is indeed an Ishet and Nash equilibrium. Once we're there, right, neither player would want to unilaterally deviate. But we haven't finished, right? We've only drawn two of the arrows here. What about, for example, what about Sue's choices? What if Bob chose up, right? Remember, to do the full arrow technique and uh, to fully look for Nash equilibrium, we'd, we'd have to do it for all rows and all columns. So. If Bob chose up, then Sue is looking at either one by going left or two by going right. So if we drew that arrow there for Sue, um, on the top row, we would draw it like that. Two is bigger than one. For Bob, what about if Bob, if Sue just did choose right? Okay. Would Bob want to choose up or down? Well, we compare, we compare his payouts are two and one. So compare two to one. Two is bigger than one. We draw the arrow there, and whoa, lo and behold, we have arrows both Point, just like we had arrows pointing, both pointing to the lower left, we also have arrows both pointing to the upper right. Okay? And in fact, upright is also a Nash equilibrium. Right? Again, remember the definition of Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium does not set, not a prediction of what will happen per se. It is not saying what you want to happen. It's not saying, it, it's all kinds of different things. It's saying a Nash equilibrium is a, if you will, an ex post concept, an after the fact concept. The idea is that if we're there, if we end up there, however we end up there, would either player want to unilaterally change their choice? And the answer, if we're, is, is for down left or up right, is no. We already sort of understand it for down left, but for up right, suppose we're at up right. Would Sue want to change her choice? No, because if she chose left, she would, she would reduce her payoff from two to one. Would Bob want to unilaterally deviate if we were in the upper right? No, Bob would want to. You know, Bob gets two by going up, one by going down, so Bob would not want to change. Clearly, they both prefer the lower left equilibrium, the down left equilibrium, to the upright equilibrium. No question about that. But the, the question wasn't, what is the likely outcome? That is not the question here. Right? I'm pretty confident that if they played this game, down left would be the most common outcome. It would happen the vast majority of the time, right? if not all the time, you know, depending on how many often you play. But that doesn't make, mean that upright is not a Nash equilibrium. Right. The definition is very specifically the idea of it's a, if it's a combination of choices, one for each player, in which neither player wants to unilaterally change their choice. Right. So if we're in, so so upright is an equilibrium because if Bob chooses up, Sue wants to choose right. If Sue chooses right, Bob wants to choose up. That makes it a Nash equilibrium. And so you had to to get full credit. Again, the question says please check any and all correct answers. You had to choose both down left and upright on this question to get any credit. Right? Now, how does that translate if you look at that and say, you know, how does that translate into your score? Well, here's actually, by the way, just since this is the first time it's coming up, this is actually directly from the Sakai website um, about how they grade uh, partial credit. So these are for any questions that, has, that have multiple correct answers and students can make multiple choices. So it says students need to select all the correct answers in order to receive full credit. There will be given partial credit. They will be given partial credit for selecting a correct answer, and we penalized for selecting an incorrect answer. Right? And this, by the way, also I, was in the introduction to the quiz. So I, I myself wrote this as well in the introduction to the quiz before you actually started the quiz, as well as in the email I sent that was sent out announcing the quiz. Example: Suppose the question is worth four points and has options A, B, C, and D, where B and D are correct choices. Okay, so four points, two correct choices out of four. Each correct answer has a point value equal to the question point value divided by the number of correct answers. So this question is worth four points in this example. There's two correct answers. So each correct answer is worth two points. So a student will be get two points for selecting B or D, right? The two correct answers. But if they select A or C, you'll be penalized two points, right? So you take away two points for any incorrect answer. So 
If B and D are correct choices, and you're, and you're asked to choose any and all correct answers, as you were in this question, right? if you chose B and D, and only B and D, you would get, in this example, four points. If you chose just B and nothing else, you'd only get two points. If you chose just D, you'd only get two points. Right? If you chose B and A, right, you would get zero. You'd get two points for B, you get two points deducted for, for choosing A. Right? And you can figure it out. Right? I mean, of course, you, what, if you, what if you chose, uh, you know, uh, A and C, two incorrect answers, you know, would seem to be negative four. No, you can't get negative four, right? Um, you know, because the actual lowest point, total point possible is zero. So basically, on this question, right, the, for your scores, this question was worth five points. Whoops. So it would, so if, if I'm not mistaken, what that means is that if you chose just down left, you should have gotten two and a half points on this, and nothing else. If you chose down left and up right, the two correct answers, you should have gotten the full five points. Right? Um, if you chose uh, anything else, right, um, if other than one correct and, you know, if you chose one of the correct answers but not both, you should have gotten two and a half points. Uh, almost any other combination, you should have gotten zero on this question. Right? If, you, if you chose, say you chose down left and up left, well, that's one correct, one incorrect, you would have gotten zero points. Um, I suppose if you had chosen, uh, you know, two correct answers, so down left and up right, and then one incorrect, up left, you could also get two and a half points. But basically, everybody should have either gotten zero, two and a half, or five. And the only way to get five points was to select the two correct answers and only those two correct answers. All right. So in the last question that was a bit problematic was question five on the quiz. This is the extensive form game I asked you to solve. So consider the extensive form depiction below of a sequential interaction between Bob and Sue. So Bob and Sue again, but now playing, instead of making a simultaneous move game as they did in the previous matrix, now they're making sequential choices. So I asked what is or are the equilibrium outcomes of this game? Please check any and all correct answers. Same as before. And again, the actual question on Sakai had a lot more description, explanation, etc. But um, I'm not going to go through all that now. So here's the, the situation. So we see that basically it is, the basic idea is that Bob can choose to act now or wait, and then after Bob, Bob makes a choice, and Sue sees what choice Bob has made. Uh, Sue can choose to act now or wait. Um, and so the idea is that if Bob chooses to act now, and then Sue chooses act now, then Sue gets four, Bob gets six, or Sue, Bob gets six, Sue gets four. If Bob chooses to act now, Sue chooses to wait. Bob gets two, Sue gets five. If Bob chooses to wait, and then Sue chooses to act now, Bob gets three, Sue gets three. If Bob chooses to wait, and Sue chooses to wait, Bob gets one, and Sue gets two. So how do we solve this? Well, let me go ahead and actually quote directly, if you will, um, from your reading on, here's your, from your reading that you were given, the Introduction to Game Theory Business Strategy. So it said, talked about a section called extensive form. As the extensive form depicts a sequence of actions and the corresponding outcomes. A node, right? So the node is here where the word where Bob is circled or Sue. These are nodes. There's three nodes in this game. Um, sometimes called the decision node. A node indicates a point at which a player must choose an action. The branches leading from a node display possible choices at the node. So going back to our thing here, so choices, Bob can either act now or wait. So the lines represent choices, right? And finally, the numbers at the end of the final branches indicate the ultimate payoffs given the sequence of choices made by the two players. All right, so that should explain what we have here. And then how do we solve it? Well, we solve it via backward induction. So this, then following that, there is a section called backward induction in your reading. It says we analyze the extensive form using backward induction, looking forward to the final decision nodes and reasoning backwards. Begin the final two nodes, you know, and again, it talked about Boeing and Airbus, so I tried to take out the references to Boeing and Airbus in particular, but, um, you know, you begin the final two modes and determine the optimal choice for the second mover at each node, right? So in other words, going back here, oops, what it's saying is we would look at the final nodes, which are Sue's choice, right, and figure out, you know, if Sue finds herself up here that Bob has chosen to act now, what would Sue choose? If... Or Sue finds herself at this node, so Bob has chosen to wait. What would they choose? Um, whoops. And so, so then analyze that, right? And we could actually do that here. So we see that Sue, right, if Sue finds herself at this node here, choosing to act, Bob has chosen to act now, then Sue moves after Bob does, choose to act now or wait. Well, if Sue acts now, Bob gets six, Sue gets four. If Sue waits, Bob gets two, Sue gets five. So Sue would choose to wait. Right. Five is bigger than four, right, for Sue. So she, if she finds herself here, she would choose to wait. Now, what about down here? Bob chooses to wait. Sue can either act now and get three, her payoff is three, or wait 
and get two. Her payoff is two. So she would choose to act now. Right? So again, if Bob acts now, Sue would want to wait. If Bob waits, Sue would want to act now. Sue wants to do the opposite of whatever Bob does. right? And so that is the step here. It says, begin the final two nodes and determine the optimal choice for the second mover. Now move to the initial node. Right, back to the first mover. So if the first mover foresees how the second mover will act as the final nodes, the first mover can determine which choice is in, in its best interest in the initial stage. Right? Um, and then the equilibrium outcome is for the first mover to choose this best choice in the first stage, with the second mover choosing its resulting best choice in the second stage. Right? So we already said that Sue would choose to wait if we were there, if, if Bob chose to act now, and Sue would choose to act now if Bob chose to wait. Right? So then from Bob's perspective, now it says go to the initial node. Now what about Bob? Well, Bob can sort of you know, eliminate from consideration, you know, the top outcome and this very bottom one, those aren't going to happen. I don't care if those numbers are a million or a billion or whatever, Bob, you know, sorry, those aren't going to happen, right? So what's going to happen is if Bob acts now, Sue's going to choose wait. If Bob waits, Sue's going to act now. So these things are off the table. So what Bob knows that if he acts now, Sue will wait and he will get two. If Bob waits, Sue will act now and he will get three. Well, three is bigger than two, right? So Sue, so Bob wants to Wait. That is Bob's optimal choice. Bob wants to wait, then Sue will act now. Right? And the question, very specifically and intentionally, by the way, doesn't ask about equilibrium strategies. But it asks about the equilibrium outcome. Right? As, as the reading said, what is the equilibrium outcome? It is the combination of choices that actually happen on the equilibrium. So in equilibrium, what's going to happen? Bob's going to wait. Sue's going to act now. That's the equilibrium outcome for Bob to wait and Sue to act now. Right? And that is the only equilibrium outcome. Right. This game, and this is often, by the way, the case that uh, that often some some simultaneous game in which there are there are multiple equilibria. If you if if choices are made sequentially, you know you can you can actually uh, you often have fewer equilibria. You know, again, just for educational purposes, let me go back for a second here. That question four. You know, for example, you know there were two equilibria in this game here. But that's because they moved simultaneously, and this was that was included in the description. You can read the description on the on the, on the quiz, and it talked about that. They or each, each player makes a choice, not knowing the other player's choice. Um, but the idea is when they when you make sequential choices, right? If Bob if if Bob moved first or Sue moved first, either way, you could figure out Bob if they suppose Bob chose first. Well, Bob knows if he chooses up, Sue will choose right. Bob knows if he chooses down, Sue will choose left. Right? So between those choices, Bob would, would prefer to choose down, and so Bob will choose down, and Sue will choose down. Similarly, if Sue moved first, right, uh, then Sue knows if she chooses left, Bob will choose uh, down. If she chooses right, Bob will, Bob will choose up. So given those choices, she looks at it and says, well, uh, four is bigger than two, I'll, I'll choose left, then Bob will choose down. So if these were sequential, no matter who moved first, we would actually end up with only un one equilibrium outcome if it was um, you know, the sequential move game. Now, but in this case, because we do have a sequential move game, we end up with the one equilibrium outcome. Right? And so again, you know, if you chose uh, that correct out answer, and only that correct answer, you got full credit, which I think was five, five points. If you chose this and something else, you got zero, because you got five points for the choosing the correct answer, and you got subtracted five points for choosing an incorrect answer, right? Or obviously, if you chose one incorrect. So the only way you get full, you know, everybody should have either gotten five points or no points on this question, right? And the only way you get the full five points is to choose wait and act now, and only wait and act now. Right? Well, that covers, again, so those are the four challenging questions on the first quiz, on module one quiz. Right? There were no particularly challenged questions in the last section on strategic biases. So again, I hope that addresses, I've gone over the, the, there were only four questions that were, you know, seemed to be uh, challenging to a, you know, again, not a majority, just more than 20%, you know, the, you know, the, the more than 20% of you had difficulties on those four questions, right? So most of you might not have had, you know, on each of those questions, a majority still did fine on them or did, got full credit, but uh, at least I've gone over the questions, you know, that would presumably uh, be the most uh, challenging or would have st stumped the most students. And so I hope that has been helpful to your understanding, not just of the quiz, right, which is, of course, a short-term objective, but more generally to the concepts addressed in the quiz and the concepts that, uh, for around which apparently there was a little more uncertainty. All right. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in class.